And upon her return, the human mother was frightened, her, uh, frightened out of her wits by the sight of an ugly, naked female owner actually breastfeeding the child. The mother, of course, naturally leapt across the tent, but screamed so loud that the Almas fled in terror. Please support this channel by subscribing and leaving comments. We had a house full of servants, and as a consequence, I learned to speak Chinese before I could speak English, and we used to watch Chinese television very frequently. During my childhood upbringing, we had many programs and many movies on the subject of the Yiren, or the Chinese wild man. And during my formative years, I can remember seeing many films with the Yiren being depicted as a sort of relic hominid, much in the vein of the Sasquatch. Uh, since my arrival in Canada and uh, my interest in Sasquatch has grown tremendously, I've also become very attached to the Mongolian Almas. Despite living in Vancouver, I will not be talking about Sasquatch. I leave that to uh, grey eminences like René de Hinden and John Green to keep you informed on that. But I owe much of my discourse to the uh, scholarly research of the following individuals who compiled and disseminated the reports of a hairy hominid said to inhabit the wilds of the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. I'd like to express my appreciation for the diligence of the late Ivan T. Sanderson, Myra Shackley, Ode Chenin, and John Green, who've all written about the odd creatures, which, we have, uh, which have become very much a part of Mongolian life. Now, all the aforementioned and myself also owe a great deal to two Russian pioneers who were V.A. Kaklov, who submitted the first scientific paper on the subject to the Russian Imperial Academy of Sciences as early as 1913, and also to B.B. Baradin, who won on an assignment on behalf of the Russian Geographical Society of St. Petersburg, actually saw a wild man, or Almas, at first hand, and thereafter submitted a detailed report of the august body that he served. However, it is the Mongolians themselves that I am most grateful, and it was Dr. Zibshen Jamsarano who took up the cudgels against the disbelieving Russian scientific bodies which stifled the writings of Kaklov and Faradin. Apparently, under communism, you were not allowed to posit anything about folklore. And Jamsarano amassed a substantial number of citing reports and anecdotal evidence relating to the existence of the Almas, and also plotted their migration based on the actual citing reports. Now, Jamsarano was in prison, unfortunately, during the Stalinist purges of the 1930s, and sadly languished and died in jail. But his work was succeeded by his brilliant pupil, the indefatigable Professor Rinchen, who heroically carried on that work of his mentor and gave us a greater understanding of what the Almas might be in the zoological and taxonomic catalog. My personal belief is that when we're talking about Sasquatches, we're talking about the Almas both in Russia, the former Soviet republics, and uh, Mongolia, we are talking about two separate creatures. It's my personal belief, after having made considerable study of the subject of the Almas, that we are indeed talking about something that is human, as opposed to something that is unknown or pongid-like, or possibly humanoid, which is which are various uh, descriptions leveled at the uh, Sasquatch. My belief is we're talking about some race of, for lack of a better word, idiots, who happen to be extraordinarily pursued unable to assimilate the use of tools or fire or reason into their lives. Now, the history of the Almas, thanks to Rinchen, um, extends right back to the 12th century. And the very first report we have of this is the visit of the uh, papal envoy, Piano Carpini, who traveled from Italy to what's now known as Xinjiang province, adjacent to Mongolia. And apparently, it was well known at that time that there was a colony or a population of Almas living south of the city of Hanil, as it was known then. It's now called Hami in modern Mongolia. Although seen frequently in the past, the Almas slowly retreated from areas where contact with man was most likely to occur on the fringes of civilization and moved into the barren wastelands of the Gobi Desert. Dr. Jamsarano interviewed countless people. His work was incredible. 
and uh, many of these had encountered Alvis in their travels. And Dewey noted that with the proliferation of people in that particular area into the known habitats of the Almas, the Almas appeared to be moving westward towards Xinjiang province in China and also to Kazakhstan in the former Soviet Union. One will note that immediately west of Mongolia, the Kazakhstan area has been a hotbed of Alma sightings, and in fact there was one as recently as 1996. An 80-year-old uh, Alma's investigator had the sighting of his life and catalogued it. I'm waiting for further information on that particular one, and I'll be uh, disseminating that through the various Sasquatch and cryptozoology organizations represented here. However, unlike the Sasquatch or Bigfoot, which show ape-like tendencies, the Almas were said by the various witnesses to be human-like, except that they were covered with reddish-black hair. Now, note that the descriptive word has always been hair and not fur. The witnesses are unanimous in their descriptions uh, in this regard. Now, the posture was described as being slightly stooped, and curiously enough, they were seen to walk with their knees bent, much as we have seen in the Patterson film, and uh, uh, according to other eyewitness accounts here in North America. Unlike Sasquatch, which walks in a plantigrade uh, fashion with the foot flat on the ground, something we can deduce uh, by their ominous tracks, the Almas walk edgewise with the outside of their feet, so the feet are sort of curved that way into the ground. There's an indication that the Almas walks with its toes turned inward in the same way that we've heard many Yeti reports described from the Himalayas. The Mongolians used to describe the Almas as the Hadisun Murtu, which is Mongolian for the edgewise walking ones, in describing the locomotion. In Mongolian speech, when one wants to indicate a person who is overly pursuit, they would describe the person as being shaggy as an Alma. This is common to this very day, apparently, in Mongolia. The creatures are often said to be very powerfully built, and the biceps and leg muscles in particular had the appearance of being extremely well defined. The Almas also possess powerful large jaws and low slung brows, which give them a slightly Neanderthal-like appearance. The female of the species is said to have long pendulous breasts, which can be slung over the shoulder when running, and when they are feeding their young on their backs. A very curious habit indeed. I'd love to see this, it's amazing. <laughs> The older females, no, I've got that kind of mind. My mind's a one-track mind, it's a dirt road. The older females are thought to have lived in uh, thickets of the Saxol bushes, and they were given the uh, moniker by the Mongolians of the Tsagat Megan, or the old Saxol woman by the Mongolians. Now, while they have a human-like appearance and tendencies, the Almas seem to be extremely low intelligence and do not have clothing, tools, or understand how to make fires. Jan Serrano wrote of a caravan which passed through Alma's country in 1927. Uh, camels strayed from the halted caravan, and the carabineers left the warmth of their fires to search for the beast. To their great shock, upon returning to the campsite, they found several Almas warming themselves around the dying embers of the fires. The Almas apparently had no idea whatsoever uh, how to keep the fire going by merely throwing a few branches from nearby saxol bushes and trees onto it. Curiously, Ivan Sanderson says that Almas have been known to trade animal skins for trinkets left by the Mongolian nomad population. This is certainly an interesting paradox. It would appear that the uh, close relation of the Almas to their fully human counterparts is very close indeed. For there are reports that men and Almas have been able to breed successfully, much like the famous Zana story that comes from southern Russia, where um, a hominid creature was able to reproduce with human males who took advantage of the poor soul. And we have the same case occurring here with the Almas as well. In fact, in the Baikongor district, there was an old timer whose name was Gendel, and he related the story of a young lama at the famous Lamingegen Monastery, who was known as the son of an Almaska, which is the female of the species, and it appears that a Mongolian traveler at some stage in history was abducted by a group of Almas. They show a bit of aggressive behavior once in a while. While in captivity, his basic urges, of course, became rather strong, and he apparently mated with a female Almas. And the end result uh, was a half-human, half-Almas male offspring. At an allegedly opportune time, the human took his son and escaped from the Almas colony, heading back for so-called civilization. And the offspring 
during the course of his growing up showed remarkable intelligence. This is again a paradox. And was eventually allowed to join a lamasery where he received fame and adulation for his very impressive scholarship. Ode Chernin relates the story of another human almas contact which had some different but nonetheless impressive results, apparently. An old Mongol desert dweller related that she once was suckled by an almas in her infancy. It seems the uh, infant was left alone by her mother, who left the yurt to tend to some outside business, and upon her return, the human mother was frightened, her, uh, frightened out of her wits by the sight of an ugly, naked female almas actually breastfeeding the child. The mother, of course, naturally leapt across the tent but screamed so loud that the almas fled in terror. The mother later related that uh, the lamas was pigeon-toed and that the, uh, sorry, the almas was pigeon-toed and that the feet were bleeding. Additionally, the almas had very long arms which simply dangled from the sides as it ran away from the uh, campsite. Now, the breastfeeding incident doesn't seem to have done any harm to this particular child, and in fact, it would appear that something in the Alma's milk was so efficacious that the old woman was able to truthfully and honestly state, in the course of the interview, that she had never been sick a day in her life. And she attributed this to a good shot of Alma's milk. Although an ancient mask with unusual ape-like features was excavated from a location in the Great Mongolian Plateau, leading many to posit, you know, Gigantopithecus or a Sasquatch-type uh, creature also existed in Mongolia, which is perfectly possible, the Mongolians themselves do not think of the Almas as apes, but rather as some form of insufficiently developed humans, and, uh, as, or perhaps even a species of allegedly wild men who are just uncivilized. Now that would put the Almas clearly and distinctly in a different class from many of the uh, similarly human-like relatives in the, well, in the former Soviet Republic, but in a different class from Sasquatch, Rangpendek, from uh, Borneo, Sumatra, Malaysia, and the other more ape-like hominids, including Yeti. It may be too much to ask that we conclude that there are two distinct types of upright, bipedal, hairy hominids inhabiting the Earth today. But the truth be known, we must arrive at this hypothesis in light of the evidence presented on behalf of the existence of the almas that we have so far. They are likely human and not apes. Now, few almas have actually been captured during the course of history, although a number of them have been killed, unfortunately. Uh, for many years, the hide of one particular almas was on display in the temple of a monastery. Now, the skin included distinctly human-like limbs and face with long hair uh, sort of falling down around the head. In 1940, two almas were inadvertently shot on the Mongolian-Chinese border during the Second World War by Mongol soldiers who mistook the pair for a couple of saboteurs. After gunning the creatures down, the soldiers were uh, rather stunned to discover that the so-called enemy was in fact two hairy wild men. And the reaction to, to having gunned them down was not one of great sorrow or one of uh, deep regret. In fact, all they thought was, oh, we shot a couple of wild men, big deal, and walked off and maintained their duties. What became of the corpses, we do not know. In a Kazakh community, they are also rather nomadic in the Gobi, uh, there was a long kept secret of their accidental involvement in the slaying of an Alma's child. The little Almas had uh, inadvertently tripped a crossbow at some stage, and it, this particular crossbow was uh, geared with a wire used to snare animals. The traps were illegal, and fear of the heavy hand of the authorities coming down upon the particular group uh, caused the locals to keep very quiet about the whole matter, and it only came to light in the face of investigation by uh, researchers who promised not to tell, as it were. Now, the child was as pursuit as the adult variety, indicating that they achieved hairiness at a rather young age. Perhaps they're even born that way. We can only posit. We have no evidence to indicate either way. In another incident, uh, a herdsman who'd gone to retrieve camels grazing in saxal grass vanished. His traveling companions were alerted to this uh, by a local that the missing man had disappeared in an area well known to contain Zangin almas, a male of the species. 
Three of the traveling group went to search for their missing friend, and soon after they came to the mouth of the cave, where they discovered a set of footprints, booted footprints, and a pair of, uh, and a set of uh, unshod feet as well. It seemed there had been some kind of disturbance of melee in front of the uh, cave, and as a consequence, they dared not enter the place. So they returned uh, to the campsite, and using their faculties of common sense, they decided they would come back with a gun. Unfortunately, the gun was used, because at dusk, a pursuit wild figure exited, and upon this exit, he was immediately struck down by a bullet from the searcher's rifle. Hurrying into the cave, the searchers found their companion alive, but in a strange state, where he seemed to be totally inco incoherent and unable to relate what had happened to him in that cave. He seemed listless, refused to talk about the ordeal with the hairy nomad of the Gobi Desert, who knows what indignities this person may have suffered in the cave, if any. Two months later, the effects of the uh, treatment at the hands of the Almas took the toll. The gentleman who was involved in this particular exercise died. Now, showing the same type of acquisitive tendencies, another Almas attempted to corral a shepherd named Gopat in the Ondor Hohoul, or the High Blue Mountains. Now, this hapless goat herd, unfortunately, had the cleverness of, uh, I fortunately had the uh, cleverness of thought to slip out of his boots and threw them at the Almas, which gave up its interest in the man to inquisitively examine the boots and uh, thereby no longer caused a threat to this particular fellow. We have another report that on occasion a horseman was driving some of his charges when he too was attacked this time by a female Almas, a question of desire perhaps. Now, the indomitable drover managed to beat off the Almasca, who then promptly fled from the scene. Didn't seem to offer very much resistance at all. Now, the general attitude of many who live in uh, Almas inhabited areas is that an encounter with the Almas brings bad luck. We have a similar parallel in certain former Soviet states as well, where they see the Almas as a rather satanic or dark or occultic or shamanistic creature. Um, Obviously, we have the same story running through a lot of native traditions in North America as well. The animals are seen by uh, the superstitious as being harbingers of particularly bad tidings. And uh, despite this, we still have incidences of the animal being killed. Uh, it's generally thought that killing an almas will bring an entire community, not just the individual, serious bad luck. The Kazakhs believe that killing an almas is likely to bring on heavy snows, unpleasant weather and a dearth of fodder for their herds. The origins of these superstitions are unknown, but we have reports of locals restraining outsiders who attempted to shoot an Almas. So strong is the feeling that they should not be killed. Other than the living Almas in the monastery and the hide that once hung from the ceiling of the temple before they were suppressed by the previous communist regime in 1937, there is no physical evidence for the scientists to examine, unfortunately. The harsh climbs of the Gobi Desert take their toll on the animals like the horse and the camel, whose desiccated and bleached remains can be seen throughout the arid regions. And in fact, I saw an article on that by the American Academy of Sciences last year. And uh, indeed, there were quite a number of dead horses and camels out there, including Brzezowski's horse. There are The last sighting uh, of an Almas that was actually recorded in the official government archives was in 1951. There seems to have been a scarcity of them. But there are constant rumors of the nomadic herdsmen rising early in the morning and seeing the silhouettes of these particular creatures. But because an ill wind is supposed to follow the sighting of an Almas, very few of them ever speak about it. Uh, the British Columbia Scientific Cryptozoology Club has attempted to contact the Mongolian officialdom to garner more information on the creatures and perhaps access uh, Rinchen's records, which may still exist. Jamsaranos, unfortunately, were completely destroyed. So if we have any of that, we will again disseminate that through the usual routes. And one of our members has been in touch with guides and travel groups in Mongolia as a prelude to organizing an expedition in search of this particular creature. And anyone joining, uh, wishing to join or being interested in this particular expedition, please see me for details. Thank you.
that it is, in fact, as I've been told by different groups, plenty of all, plenty of all, that sophisticated humans. Uh, I don't really see in your talk, although it's fascinating and wonderfully delivered, what would lead you to the conclusion that it is homo sapiens? Unless it's that one uh, cross back cross hybridization you're talking about. You could have any number of F1 hybrids, and it says nothing about common specificity. I think you said that there was one where two generations were involved. Yes, we have the case of these animals being able to interbreed with human beings. Yes, That's led me to a degree, yeah. To a second generation is what matters. Many species can cross one generation and produce a viable offspring. That doesn't prove kind of specificity, but a second generation back cross is more difficult to accomplish with two different species. But when you're talking about longer arms, pursuitness, you would expect some, uh, over time, you would expect mutation. You would also expect a certain amount of uh, introgression of genes if you were having any kind of crossing at all. Uh, you would not expect genetic drift alone to account for the maintenance of these characteristics over many generations. And that's why you're a scientist and I'm not. I believe it. <laughs> so the fact is, yes, uh, from, from what you've said, that is perfectly possible. But my personal belief is that from the Mongolians who are familiar with certain types of monkeys and apes, I take it from them that they consider this to be either Homo sapiens or one of the, uh, you know, the subgroups of Homo sapiens. So As they opposed, have contact with other kinds of primates. They have, indeed, oh, yes. Good. Question? John, do your sources mention any language in Talos? No, they don't speak at all. They're speechless. Um, in the case of the Russian Almas, for instance, Zana was trained to do menial tasks around the, uh, the farm site where she was kept. And there's also another incident in the uh, former Soviet Republic of a male of the species that was also taught simple tasks like picking up things, fetching water, etc. But there was no faculty of speech as such. Question? So these, these incidents that you're just speaking about sound like they're uh, confirmed by lots of different people, maybe in the same village or the same area. It sounds like there's a lot more, uh, more of a confirmation of the sightings or the existence than Sasquatch. Uh, that's not for me to say. It's because the, as, as far as the distribution is concerned, I'm not absolutely sure about the distribution of these sightings. There may be over a vast area of the Gobi Desert, which is humongous to say the but, least. But in terms of the delivering water chores or something, obviously this was over some period of time. More than one person is reporting having seen this. Yes, but this was in Russia, not Mongolia. So we, we don't have any reports other than the, uh, the famous monk who had this immense faculty for learning. He became an intellectual per se, but we don't have any reports from Mongolia, but we do from Russia, so it would be a different distribution. Question in the back. Mr. Steenberg. Yes, uh, the Zana story is actually a Russian story, too, not a Mongolian one. It's a Russian story, not a Mongolian one. It's from southern Russia, probably Georgia. Question back there. Yes, I'd like to commend Mr. Harvey and Mr. Perez for giving the Asian man-beast anthropoid its due. Uh, my question is, and could you comment on the veracity of the following yarn? Uh, following the Russian Revolution in 1917, circa 1923, uh, pro-Tsar's troops, the White Army, led by a Colonel Karapatayan, allegedly cornered a man-beast anthropoid in the cave in the Pamir Mountains, fired into the cave. They thought it would hold up Army troops. It came running out, and they gunned it down. Could you comment on that, please? Right. The story's actually a bit jumbled there. The case was Victor Karapetian, uh, Lieutenant Colonel, Russian Army Medical Corps, 1941. Oh, he was called in by the... Uh, the uh, the particular unit down there in southern Russia, they thought, you know, they had a peculiar captive and they thought he might be a German, okay? No, no but this particular creature was, uh, was held inside a shed. It was sweated profusely in the freezing cold, would not eat meat, was pursued from head to toe, had powerful muscles in, on his body, and also had a peculiar protruding jaw. When it was interviewed, it could not respond with speech, when Karapetian looked into its eyes, he found them to be, in his own words, the eyes of an animal and not a man. I shouldn't have mentioned Colonel Karapetian. That's an entirely different idea. It's a different story. story. The 1914 incident, yes, I've heard about as well, but I haven't got any corroboration on that other than what I've read in books. Okay. I have a question here. Okay. I've heard um, a story about uh, a beast that's been captured in Russia, and they use him as a weapon. Yes. Uh, what is the story we have no uh, apparent uh, information on them being used in the salt mines of Siberia. On the occasions where they were captured, one I believe was in Kazakhstan, which is definitely not Siberia, and the other one was in, in, the, the old, uh, in Georgia, what was part of old Russia. 
Uh, we do have uh, the case of the Chuchuna, which is a huge, massive hairy hominid in the seven foot region, but known to wear skins, which is really bizarre, existing in Siberia, but I've never heard of a Chuchuna working in a salt mine. That was reserved for the German army. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Before we hear our next guest, Jody Cook from Ohio, Cincinnati, Ohio, we're going to take a 15-minute break to stay on our time schedule. 15 minutes. If you're enjoying all this rare and unique content, please show your support by subscribing and leaving comments.